name is uh, Mark Ransford. I'm a captain of a sport fish boat. These are my crew over here to the right. Um, I got started in Wahoo fishing in the mid to late 80s. Um, I was a charter boat captain out of the Boca Hotel in Hillsborough Inlet, uh, and as well as Deerfield Beach. I was chartered by a guy that was a commodore of the Bimini Big Game Club, and he first brought me out there to start Wahoo fishing and competitively for tournaments. When we started in the late 80s, we brought Bermuda style fishing, which was fishing two wire lines, uh, mullet, horse ballyhoos, Hawaiian eyes, sea witches. We'd fish the two cigar lead, uh, similar to a high speed setup. And then we'd fish two downriggers with 10 pound downrigger balls. Um, we'd put them 50 feet back on drops and 50 feet down for the setup. Uh, Ronnie Chapman, and uh, Bill McMurray, who ran the concrete machine, were the first to bring the high-speed lure fishing to the, to the tournament series. Um, in those days, wahoo fishing, we fished 15-pound uh, minimum. We were allowed to catch as many wahoos as we could catch in a day. We came in, we weighed every wahoo that we caught. Bahamian government didn't like that. We were coming in with 20, 30, 35 fish in a day weighing 300 pounds of 14, 15, 16 pound wahoos. Um, while fishing the Bermuda style, um, what was happening is we'd be trying to hold the edge and although it was very good and we had a 50 mile boundary, um, these guys were able to, with trolling high speed, were able to take the line on, you cover more ground, hit more fish quicker. And by the time we got there, they'd already been on the fish and gone and they were, the fish were busted up and it was over for us. So it took a little convincing for the guy that would charter us to let us switch over to high speed lure fishing. Um, once we got started high speed lure fishing, we started trying to perfect what we were doing. Wahoos are mackerels. They're just like every kingfish that's on the line now. Um, I watched a video on PBS one time and it showed a school of wahoos sitting on an edge and the wahoos were literally circling just like you see mackerels coming down the beach and above them, there were wahoos kind of staging up above. So we used to run that line, we'd get a bite, we'd keep on going, try to keep from letting those guys pass us. And what we found out is, is hey, maybe I had to get in there and catch them, get set back up, come back around, just like you do kings out here out front, come through that school again, and then boom, you get another bite. We thought we were onto something. Then when you're doing this, we. Instead of worrying about that one fish, trolling down the line, pulling offshore, worry about getting that fish, the best thing you can do is once you get one fish on and he's screaming, if you got a team of guys in your boat, have them go to the rods that haven't been bit yet, reel and stop, reel and stop, jig it, reel and stop. You'll find that if you do this, boom, you got a second fish on. Kind of keep going down that line, jig it again, have it go to the next rod, try to get a third fish on. Maybe a fourth if you can try it. If you don't, start pulling your boat offshore. And as you're pulling offshore, start pulling your boat back out. Low, lessen the drags on the reels because you have an a, a absorbent amount of drag on that reel when you're high speeding. If you come to a full stop and you let that drag come tight, you're putting too much pressure on that fish. Wahoos are a, a fish that he doesn't come up and eat it like a blue marlin. He's gonna come up and eat it from the side. You'll find that most of your wahoo bites are, they could be hooked on the outside end rather than down the hatch. Now, if you got a hundred pound wahoo, he'll probably take it down the hatch, but most of them, they're gonna come in the side, they're gonna bite it in half or in thirds, they'll come back around and eat it again. When we catch, um, we do a lot of fishing for triple digit wahoos, and the triple digit wahoos that we catch generally will have a, a file fish this big in his belly, or he'll have a skipjack tuna that's, you know, maybe eight, 10 pounds, and that fish will be in three pieces in his belly, but he'll have all three pieces in. So it kind of tells you that he's coming in, eating that fish, and then he's coming back around and eating the pieces. It's, it's, I find that like when you're fishing Bimini, Chub Key, even Freeport, these wahoo, you don't find a lot of, you know, 80 to 100 pound wahoo. They're generally school fish. They're just like mackerels. They'll be, um, there could be a school of five or there could be a school of 150. So when you're in them, you just, you want to come in, try to pick them. 
Don't try to get back in them until you're all set up. Work that fish out, get them in, get them back in the boat, get your whole spread back out, and then come back down the same line you did, work yourself till you're set up when you get right back to them. Um, when we first started, we didn't have plotters. We had depth sounders. We had a, a Loran 961. And um, so it was important for us to try to drive that boat with a depth sound because we didn't know where we were. Um, nowadays with these plotters, you, you can see where you had the bite. You can see where you turned off. You can see your circle. You can work your way back. And it's a lot easier to pinpoint these fish. These fish are, uh, it's, it, it's really not rocket science once you find the fish, but it's important not to get back into that school too quickly because you will spook them. We, um, we have worked a long time on like lure development, trying to figure out what lure works best. And um, I have a variety of different lures up here, which I'm gonna go through some of them with you. Um, when Islander came out, Islander uh, only came in silverhead and st your standard colors. And when Tommy Green owned this place, he allowed me to make contact with Islander and we started having Islander produce special lures for us. So I'd have them make redheads, blue heads, and then, um, and then like a purple with a chartreuse stripe or, you know, so what we found was that uh, we'd go out there one year and they'd be eating purple with chartreuse. And I'm like, all right, come back. I want 10 more of those. I'll be ready for them. I go out there the next year, they be eating purple and chartreuse. They might be eating blue and white. They might be eating pink and blue. They might be eating black and red. So what we learned was, is you got to have an enough colors that you can try to match what's happening. So then we tried to figure out why this was happening. When you're trolling down the line and you see a, a lot of flying fish getting up in front of you, it's probably better to look at uh, blue and whites, pink and blues, um, not big lures. Like we find that lures like this, like when we see a lot of hound fish skipping, you'll see them skipping off the edge. They usually jump off from the depths we find that a longer lure works good when the houndfish are there, which is something to kind of take note of. Wahoos like houndfish. They like flying fish. They love tunas. We find that the big fish really like skipjack tunas. So if you see skipjack tunas working an edge, that's a good place you want to be. Um, watercolor in wahoo fishing is very important. I mean, if, if any of you guys went wahoo fishing and the sargasms packed up on the edge, it's the worst day you ever had high speed lure fishing. It's, they, it doesn't come off. You, it, it won't come off till you wind it all the way up and it might fall off once you got the lure at the back of the boat. Um, blue water is very important. The cleaner the blue, the better you are. If you see green stained water, you're better off kind of picking up, running the line, trying to find a better place to fish. I'm not saying that you can't catch a Wahoo in green stained water. I'm just saying that the best wahoo fishing generally are being that that purple blue is the optimum water that you want to see. Um, structure is very important with wahoos. They they like a, they like a hard line. They like pinnacles. They like points. They like drop offs. They like anywhere where that that current's moving in or off the bank, and where the fish are going to come in to feed on that stuff rolling off. You know, most, most of the time, wahoo fishing is usually best at the bottom of the tide. Dead low tide seems to be the best. We always try to be in the spot we want to be, the last, the last hour of the tide, or the last hour of the top of the tide, and we fish it to the other side. That's usually your best bet. Um, I have had days where it doesn't work like that. You could have a, a slick, calm day, sunny, high skies, and uh, slow bite it's just mere calm and all of a sudden you'll we had a point one time where we found them off riding rocks um and off of them you know south of bimini and we hadn't had nothing go on all day and we caught 300 pounds in an hour and a half mm. right off riding rocks and it was just out of the nowhere once we found those fish we stayed in there we'd work them came back there's double triple quad double triple quad and uh Nothing, nothing special there, you know, 20, 25 pound class school of fish, but it was a big school of fish and we worked that school very hard. Um, when, uh, 
the Bahamian government decided that they didn't want us coming in with 25, 30 fish every time. They had changed the rules that we could weigh two fish a day and our best five fish counted for the tournament. So when they first introduced this, I decided, you know what? I'm going back to old school. I'm gonna break out the cigar ledge. I'm gonna break out my mullet. I'm gonna break out my horse pally hoop, double hook them. I'm gonna put a skirt on there. I'm gonna slow down and I'm gonna work the areas that I know Wahoos like to be. Uh, that lasted for about two thirds of a day. We caught 40 pound kingfish. We caught 50 barracudas. And all we found is it just slowed down our production. And so about 1.30 that afternoon, I wound them up. I ran down to a little point that's between Stirrup K and, and, and the gingerbread grounds. And this little point, I put them out, put the high speeds out, caught a 58 and 55, right? Just real quick. Decided I was no longer going to fish like that ever again. Ran back. Uh, we didn't take the daily, but we ended up winning that tournament at the end of it. Um, Wahoos are, I guess, one of my favorite fish to catch. After we started fishing the tournament series, it was all big boats. Everybody fished big boats. We fished, when they, we first started high speed, we'd fish two Manil wire lines. We'd fish, Tommy had just, braid just came out. Tommy wanted me to try the braid. So I brought this 200 pound braid that he had in the store. And we put 200 pound braid on the longs, Manel to the, to the shorts, and then we fished uh, tag lines on 80 pound on 30 pound breakaways on our tag lines off our riggers. And during that time of fishing, we would, we would see like patterns. Some days they'd be eating that Monel, some days they'd be eating that, that braid, and some days they'd be eating them, them mono. So we were, but we always found that on a rough day that Monel on the wire lines on a bent butt held the water the best. Wahoo fishing, is usually not a slick calm sport. I mean, you're out, you're fishing, it's two to four, it's four to six. You're pounding into the sea all day long. Your mates are sitting in their grundings, they're soaking wet, head to toe. They're not happy because they've been whining weed all day, but that's wahoo fishing. And um, after we uh, started fishing that way, we decided that six lines was getting to be too much. It kind of slowed down the production. You get a fish on, you try to make that bank offshore. You got to bring down your tag line. You got to break that 30 pound off. You got to wind that fish in, try to get it cleared. And it was just slowing us down, especially in a tournament setup. We were finding that it was not productive because it was, at that time, you wanted to be on the line. You wanted to get your fish. You wanted to jig up as many as you could. You wanted to get offshore. You wanted to get your fish in. You want to get set back up. You want to get back on the line and ahead of everybody else. Some of you might know me, and you might have seen my boats out there. If I think that I can hold the line from you, I probably won't let you pass me. It's, uh, I, uh, I know the importance of it. Why are you smiling? But it, it is the way it is. I've, I've kind of gotten better over the years, but once upon a time, I didn't want anybody to know what we did. We hit our lures, we'd sit in the engine room, we'd re-skirt, we would, by the time we got in, if my mates left one lure out, I wasn't a happy guy. Um, it's not how it is anymore. It's, I'm glad to see people enjoying the sport. There's a lot of Wahoos out there. They're a lot of fun to catch. Um, so I, I do. You know, one of my friends is in here is one of the best blue marlin fishing in the world. And I love blue marlin fishing, but there's days where you could sit there all day watching a bait and never see a bite. Wahoo fishing. When it's Wahoo season, you can count on at least getting a few bites and you might catch quite a few. So once we started doing the Bimini, cat, my boss had a house in Cat Key. So we would spend months at end in Cat Key. So we would fish, you know, Isaacs, Gingerbread Grounds, Riding Rocks, Orange K. These are like great, you know, even Ocean K in front of Ocean K. These are great spots to catch Wahoos. But you could literally run 50 miles down to Orange K and you get down there and the water's dirty and that's that's not a good day. Now you're now you're trying to figure out what to do. So um K Sal Bank, uh some of the best fishing I ever had. I took a young mate of mine down there a few years ago and uh, we sat in right at Barracuda Rocks and the dog rocks and we started running down. And um, in an hour we had 24 in the boat and it's it was where I wasn't even trying to catch them. We did one on or two, 
and I'd try to slow down and their boys would be jigging him up and triple, quad, pull off, we'd get him. After three or four passes, we didn't know what to do. We had too many wahoos. Now we're trying to get rid of them in their bite. Now I've never caught a monster wahoo in Case Out Bank. I, I think the best wahoo I've ever caught in the, on the Bimini side, maybe 68 on Isaacs. And I had a monster one time off of the gingerbread grounds that I thought was a blue marlin that I probably should have fought differently, but I ended up losing that fish. Um, once the center council boats started showing up into the Wahoo series, it kind of broke up the Wahoo championships and we weren't getting 50, 60 boats in the tournaments anymore. We were getting, you know, a handful of big boats and a bunch of center councils. And when we got to the Grand Bahama side, these guys were starting to run through the, the channel and running out the backside, running the Matanella Reef. We'd have to run an extra 25 miles to get to where they are. By the time we got there, they were done with business. So what happened was, is they kind of broke up the big boats going in there. And we were mad at the center councils at that time because we thought the big boats ruled. Well, once I started fishing center councils, I realized that there's a big advantage to center council fishing, other than the fact that you get a little bit wet on a rough day. Um, we adjusted from our technique of six rods to four on the big boat. And the main reason was is you get your baits out there and you start making turns and you start sinking leads. This lead crosses over this lead. You might not even see it, but once it does, it sits back there and it, it just twists up your braid lines. I don't, any of you guys wahoo fish, I'm sure you've seen that happen. And again, that slows down your production. It takes quite a bit of time to try to get it back to where you need to go. So what we did is fish four lines. I fished two Monel lines on bent butts right off the corner. And right above them, I fish uh, straight butts on the 100 pound braid. And I fish 64 ounces on my Monel. And I'll fish anywhere from a, a 32 to a 48 on my other two. And the way I like to fish a four bait system is I fish 150s on my two Monel short. I fish a 250 on my, on my uh, 48 and I fish a, a, a 350 on my other one. So it's, 150, 150, 250, 350. And that seems to kind of stabilize us having big problems on a big boat. Now, when I fish on a small boat or a center council boat, I kind of fish like Ronnie did back in the day, is I realized that I don't want to spend time un unmessing my lines all day. So I'd fish two lines. I'd fish, or fish two Monels off the corners, and then I'd put one down the center, way back like a shotgun. This allows you to make all the turns you need. You don't have to worry about twisting your baits up. And it's, you, can, you won't have to worry about untangling lines because this does happen quite a bit in water fishing. And in the same token, you get a bite on the wire line on the left side, run to the right side, try to jig that wire because that fish are right there. You're still moving along at 15 knots. Uh, once you, if you get a fish on that one, now you have to start working that high line. Bring it in, bring it in, stop. Real stop, real stop, jig, real stop. You'll see, boom, third, third fish on, pull them offshore, work them. And the reason we pull offshore is that for obvious reasons. The sharks, the barracudas, everything, they, they kind of focus on that line. And they see that fish fighting and all that flash going on, it's an attractor to the sharks. So we try to bump them as far offshore as we can. Um, I'm, we don't, I'm not a big motor guy unless I got a real big fish. I'll, I'll keep the boat in gear. I might even come in and out of gear, but you always want to keep that line tight because those fish are quick. And if you slow down or come to a dead stop, they slack line you. Chances are you might get away. Like I say, most wahoos are, can be hooked outside in more than they are inside out. Uh, if they're inside out, you usually do really good. But if they're snagged on the outside, they turn direction. A lot of times they'll pull the hook. Um, another important thing when you're bringing a wahoo up to the corner, um, you do not want to keep that boat straight, but that whatever side that fish is coming in, put him in the corner, kind of make a gradual turn so that fish is coming in an angle to the transom. That way your mate can stand here and he can leader your fish up and your gaff man can reach right over his shoulder and stick him. Mm -hmm. If you bring him up into the stern of the boat and he gets in that prop wash, he starts rolling around, he's going to, uh, He's got a good chance of getting off, or you got a good chance of missing the gap, or you got a good chance of getting the line fouled up in your gap and losing the fish. So it's really important to try to put that fish in a corner when you're handling it. 
it's just safer for everybody as well, especially well, on an outboard boat, you always want to have to try to get it to the corner. But um, I guess uh, that being said, um, rigging is something that I really like. I mean, it's, I would sit home at night and uh, dream, dream my own lures. I would dream how I'm going to rig them, dream how to make them safer, dream on how to make them work. Uh, when you're rigging a Wahoo lure, and you're using cable. Like in the old days, we would use 19 wire. We'd put a cigar lid out. We'd put 30 feet of 19 wire off of it. We'd run it right to the Wahoo lure. And our purpose and thought about that was then was, if, if any of you have been Wahoo fishing going down the line, you'll get a lead bite from time to time. They'll eat that lead. And when they eat that lead, they slide down. And if you got a mono leader, they'll slide down there and cut you off. You lose, you lose your lure and, you, and most of your shock cord. So we thought, well, we use 19 wire. We'll put it straight to the scar, let it eat the lead. Maybe you'll slide down and get impaled in this thing. Well, two things happen with that. A, when you're a leader in 19 wire and you put it in the cockpit, it don't lay flat on the ground. It's a, it's a big old coiled spring. And um, it kind of got dangerous for the mates to try to deal with it. Leader of fish, shark comes underneath that. You got 19 wire, he's standing in the, the same in 19 wire. That could be a bad business. And the second problem was, is when you're high speed and going down that line and you got direct wire to it, you have electrolysis happening really bad. Electrolysis, I've seen 19 wire where you're patrolling on, not even for maybe an hour, hour and a half, you're reeling them in to check your baits and there's no lure on there anymore. It's, it's just a blank of 19 wire at the end of the yo-yo. About where these things would meet the, meet the heads at electrolysis, especially if at a brass ring or when we use the old stainless steel jet heads right about where it made that connection that point it would break there so then we decided we'd go to mono so that's where we started using the mono um, we do still get bit off i can't say that we don't back in the old days you had a an eye on this end and an eye on this end and that's when this cable came in and this does kind of save you sometimes um not all the time but it does save you it also um, when the old leads when they used to make especially when you got into the 48 ounce, it was a bellied lure in the belly and it was long and skinny on the ends, kind of like a, like a old crappie bobber on each end. When they pour these molds, that mold gets extremely hot. And when they let that thing out of the mold, the actual ends of that lead would kind of warp a little bit. And when you put that lead into the water, I hated the 48 because you, you put it in that rod tip, just be bouncing. When I seen that, bring it in, I'd rather have a 32 or a 16 than have that bounce. It doesn't, everything has to be lined up. When you're Wahoo fishing, this lead's important, but the point of what this lead really does is with the lead and the shock cord going to the lure, all it does is stabilize that lure in the water column. Um, that lure, Wahoos don't want to jump and bait. They want that lure underneath the surface. It might only be three, four, or five inches, but you want that lure in the water. You do not want it skipping. This lead, you'll see it when you're trolling down the line. It'll be 150 back, especially on the 64. You'll see the lead come out of the water. Your shock cord will still be bellied in the water and your lure will still be functioning straight behind it. Almost creates a venturi to keep your lure stuck to the water. We, uh, we worked really hard on this. I took, the, I took these lures and we were coming back from the Southern Bahamas. It was slick mirror calm and we were off stirrup K. And I had my mate take all our lures and we set up two spreads on 32 ounce cigar leads and we were trolling them behind the boat. And I climbed up in the tower and I was watching our lures working in the water column. And when I looked back there, I was kind of disappointed in what I saw. 85% of our lures, any of the cone shaped lures, which work extremely well. I mean, even this one, you can see it, it's already got a bite this year. I mean, it's, they work very well, but when you put them in the water column, there's no movement at all with this lure. It, it basically looks like it's inanimate, just moving through the water column. So I started thinking about this and I was like, you know, there's gotta be a way to create more action to these fish. So I had, uh, went home, I got a big dowel rod, I got myself a knife and I carved out what I thought would be the perfect lure. And I kind of modeled it over a, a Marlin lure that's called a 1656 slam. So I took that lure and out of wood, I, I carved it up and I took it to a machinist. And um, I had him machine it, you know, 
do the program and machine the lure for me. And you'll see that out of all these lures, it's completely different than any of the techniques that we think for Wahoos. Everything we wanted back in the day was a, an r and 37 or a 28. We wanted a bullet headed lure. We wanted a jet head with a cone head. These lures created no movement in the water. They were straight. Not saying they don't work. When I created this lure, it changed everything. But when I first created, I was thinking that I was gonna eliminate the trolling lead and I was gonna be able to troll. This lure is very heavy. I created Titan Create 2. I had to make one out of brass and I had to make one out of aluminum. So I took them down there and I started trolling them. The aluminum lure worked very well, but electrolysis was very hard on the aluminum. And one day a fish and it turned it completely fuzzy and it was already starting to eat out the holes inside the jets. So we decided to go with the, the brass lures. And then I decided that the one thing that I find with Wahoo fishing is Wahoo lures need to have body. Wahoos like lures with body. They don't, they don't really like a, a skinny lure. They like, they like them with substance. And back in the day, um, uh, no alibi used to make a 16 ounce, no alibi feather lure that they used to use for giant tuna fishing up north. No alibi, I had got a couple of them from Tommy way back in the day. And we started rigging them and fishing them for, for Wahoos. And we found, oh my God, these things work. So I was like, Tommy, I want, I want more of these. He said, well, so we contacted No Alibi, which was bought by CNH Lures. And they had did away with that 16 ounce mold. And I, I was kind of bummed about it because that lure was working really good. We, we thought we were really onto something. And you know, a No Alibi feathers slanted, it's cone head. It gave you more movement in the water again. So again, I whittled one out. I had them make one, I have the mold to this day. And um, it worked really well for us for a while. It's still a great highline bait. But what we found was that those feathers created the body that we were looking for. And it also creates movement in the water. You know, unlike the skirted lure went to see which lays down, it basically stays pinned the whole time it's moving. A feathered lure, I call these feather dusters, um, I make, you can see, I make them all, I invert the hairs, I buy them bound from England, and then I put them on here and the, there's three layers. They fill the lure up really well. And what they do is that, you know, that looks like the fatness of a little tuna. And um, so we brought these out to the Southern Bahamas and we tried them the first season. And we were fishing the uh, Oahu tournament out there and I put one on the shore put you know, another one of these, uh, the Black Hole or the Island Express. This has always been one that I always love to fish on the short. It's, you know, the Islander's a great lure. It's really good when the flying fish are around. It's really good when the hound fish are around, but I wanted to have that jet head. I wanted to create the body to the lure. And this lure works really good, especially on a short rigger day. So um, I had one on that side. Well, this lure was getting eaten. This lure wasn't, and we were having a, a remarkable bite on this. Um, so we were practice fishing. We went over there for the first leg of the Wahoo tournament. We ran over to San Salvador. We set up on the sea mounds. And um, uh, first one, first was a 105.1. And then we caught another one about 90. And we caught a few in the 60 to 70 pound range. And we thought, yep, this is it. So I came back, went over to the guy who makes my heads for me, ordered 25 more of them got the brass, take them to the powder cutter, started playing with different colors and uh, went back out there again. And now, to be honest with you, when I fish, I have at least two of these out any time that I'm wahoo fishing. Even in Bimini, um, there's a guy that comes in here, his name's Mike Moe. He runs a boat called the CD and his boss man had a place in Cat K. Well, he shows up one day and we weren't really set up for wahoo fishing, but they were going wahoo fishing. So I threw out our basic little, you know, small bait spread. We start up the line and Mike comes back in and he goes, hi, I beat you Wahoo fishing today. Well, my whole life, I don't like to be out fish. I, I have a, I used to have a thing and I probably still have it, right? But, uh, so the next day I pulled out my heads. He caught two, we caught 31 of them. And uh, the head, the, the head, it, and the only reason I'm telling you is you can't buy this head. But what I'm telling you is, is don't be afraid to evolve a little bit when you're fishing. 
Everybody has a little trick to their technique. My technique might not work completely for you. I am very confident in my technique. I know that if I was to go fishing for wahoos and wahoos are there, I'm confident that I'm going to catch them. Um, you got to match what you're fishing for too, though. If you're going to Chub K, uh, you could probably catch 50 wahoos on a good day when they're biting, but you're not going to catch many wahoos over 30 pounds there. The average one's probably 20 if it's best, but you can catch a lot. Now you can go around the corner and go to the stirrup. You can fish about where the cruise ships moor up there to go into Cocoa Plum Island. And on that line there coming back to the east, you can catch them 60, 70 pounds. Um, on this gingerbread grounds is a good place to catch them from 30 to 50, 60 pounds. And I've caught some up there 50, 60 at Isaac. On the Bimini side, uh, you know, you usually don't catch very many big ones on that side. Grand Bahamas, you come around the corner, uh, Old Bahama Bay fishing up towards Memory Rock. They're usually the same thing. They're 20, 30 pound fish, but you get up towards White Sands, they'll get a little bigger. You get over to Mount Nell on the other side, and then you're back to 60, 65, 70 pounders. Um, Hole in the Wall has monster fish. Gorda Key, which is about 20 miles east or west of uh, uh, Hole in the Wall, there's a little there's a little there's a little piece of land that sits off there, and it's called Green Cay. Um, which is, there's a lot of green caves in the Bahamas, but this is just a little speck. And that little piece right there, I have caught three wahoos. Um, I've only caught two over a hundred. I've caught another one that was like 96. Um, that place has monster wahoos and they're there. Where hundred pounders bite is a place where you want to always pay attention if you're looking for big fish. Because it, to me, what I've noticed over the years that Big fish seem to relate to the same structure over and over again. Um, we got places in Cat Island. I was the, the best day I really ever had with big fish. We were over there, I mean, it was so far back, we had 12, 12 senators and wire and lines back then. And we were just experimenting with planer fishing. And we were had a 16 black high speed planer. And I had two of them out and I'd been fishing on the on the north side of the Columbus Point for a while, and I really hadn't done nothing. And I, and I had a few bites on the other side, so I decided instead of going out and around the entire pinnacle, I decided to cut straight across. It's 82 feet across there. And I, get, I cross over that, and uh, I get to this little place where it's 82 feet, and there's like this, on the chart, it's still there. It's like, a, it looks like a peanut shape. And on this side, it's 156 feet. This side's 82. I was cutting across the 82, taking a direct line for the other side, had a quad on, the smallest was 115 and the largest was 134. And this opened my eyes because I thought, oh my God, my whole life I've been trying to stay out here in 200 feet of water driving, not trying to get inside that. I used to get mad at myself. I, I haven't mentioned that, but to drive these lines, which we learned in a long time ago when we only had sounders, you can try to drive your boat in 200 feet of water you're in the optimum strike zone. It's not possible for you to drive that boat in 200 all day. You might muzzle into 125, 130. You might be out to 400, but you really want to focus on staying there because that'll keep you in the strike zone, both from the inshore side and the offshore side. So anyway, we get that, we get those big fish in and I'm like, huh, we'll go through there again. Well, it spreads the spool on two of my 12 of so I had to put them away and we never got a bite again there that time of year. I uh, had a buddy who really started, they, Tommy called me up and these guys were getting into Wahoo fishing from St. Augustine and he wanted me to get these guys hooked up on high speeding in the Bahamas. They were used to fishing in St. Augustine but not used to high speeding in the Bahamas. So I rigged them up, I went over there, we helped them out a little bit. So they were going over to fish a tournament in Cat and um, I wasn't able to go for that tournament. And I said, look, let me give you a spot. I want you to go over that spot and see what happened. Well, he calls me up that night and he goes, well, Cap, 96 pounds, you're off your spot. I, again, I, I realized then that those fish are relating to that spot. And the cool thing about that spot is, is on the deep water side, like I said before, there were a lot of little black fins, a lot of little skipjacks would come up on the boils as the water's coming up from the Caribbean. It's hitting that side. It's pushing up all that bait and wahoos. 
And the tunas are in there and these wahoos are making a living on these tunas. And the same for Gorda Key that I had mentioned to you before. Gorda Key, you can go down there and you might catch, you know, five, six, ten wahoos this big. They're tiny little wahoos. But what we found out one day we were leading her in one of those little wahoos and a big girl came up there and ate her in half on it, just right at the transom of the boat. And we realized now that you need to fish where those, those smaller pelagic type fish are coming to the bank. Wahoos make a living, as well as weed lines. Like I said, I've caught uh, two wahoos that were in that triple digit that had file fish this big. Enough that Jordan and I went to ICAST a few years ago and we met up with a guy that makes all these rubber fish and I'm like, hey man, you need to make us a, a damn file fish about that big that we can set a hook in, bump troll down these weed lines and see what, what we could do, which we never really did, but they're there. Um, now we'll get in, I'll get into the rigging with you. When you're rigging a wahoo lure, it's important for that hook to be exposed out the back of the lure. You want, you want him to have a clean shot to be able to be gapped. If you have it inside the lure, a lot of times at that speed, it might foul up into the skirt. The rubber might hook on the barb. That might just slow you down from getting penetration on the hookup. Um, the other thing is, is this cable, when you're dealing with cable, cable gets very, it's like a hypodermic needle on the end of this. So we always use two crimps, never use an aluminum crimp, especially on stainless steel. That electrolysis within two hours will eat that crimp off this thing and you'll lose your lure. Always make sure you use a double barrels, sleeves crimp. And uh, I like to use two crimps on every rig on both ends. And the point of it is I set one for where my loop is and I always like to slide the other crimp down to where the end of that wire is. Because if you're ever leading in a big wahoo and he wants to make a little bit of head shake or run on you and that cable's exposed, it's going to make you bleed deep. It'll take you deep. So we always try to cover that up. That's very, very important for it. Um, I like to stiff rig my hooks. And a lot of times I will measure and, to where my head is, I, you know, I set it beside it, I'll lay it flat, I'll lay it beside it, I'll figure out where my hook lay is, and then I'll set that last crimp to where that crimp falls at the back of the skirt, okay? Um, shock cords and, and, and uh, snap swivels is another thing. I don't know how many times, you see, that's how this stuff is. We've had, uh, we've had fish on, Got a shock cord on, we're leading up the fish. We get to the fish and this snap swivel is stretched all the way open and the leader is literally hanging on that hook. And it's like, hey, you didn't snap the swivel. Like, well, yeah, I did. No, you didn't, it wouldn't be open. It was. So what we've found over on both ends from the rod end of this thing, I don't really worry where the leader is because that doesn't have the weight to it, but where the rod connects to this loop end and where this end connects to your shock cord, I always take a piece of Monel after I snap that on. I take that Monel and I and I you know I'll wrap it I'll wrap it around the snap swivel so this snap swivel can't open. I don't know why it happens. Okay, the only thing I can think of is the lure tumbling or the weight or the pressure. But I've had this happen six or seven times to me. And from then on, I always take this piece of Monel and I always he might stretch that baby down, but that baby ain't opening no more. And uh, I think that's a very important thing. The other thing, because of your speed and the pressure that you're putting on that lure, on the loop end of your shock cords, don't just take a crimp, crimp your crimp on and leave that tag end hanging. I like to take and uh, you take that thing, you put your crimp on, put it through the other side, get yourself a cigarette lighter, mushroom the end of that mono, push it with your fingers so you can expand it. And when you do that, it does two things. The first thing it does is if you're you're rolling through anything, it's not going to get hung, it's not going to get snagged, it's not going to get caught in your hand. And the second thing is, is it now builds a point where when you put that crimp in, that it's near impossible for that crimp to pull. Because you'll be surprised how much pressure can be with a wahoo. You got, you know, maybe uh, 22, 23, up to 28 pounds of drag, depending on the head you're pulling. And uh, you got a fish that's freight training you on that thing. If you don't have every bit of your terminated tackle perfect, it's not going to be successful. And um, you really want to pay attention to that part of the rigging. 
The other thing is, is uh, when you got Wahoos on and you're trolling along and you had your 28 pounds of drag on it and you got your fish on and you're wanting to pull your bait back, your boat back, as you, before you do that, you really want to, and you got to be kind of cautious about this. You really just want to back your drag. If you want to scale your drag, mark your drag, say, you know, this is where you're trolling. This is where you want to be when you pull back. Because if you got 28 pounds of drag on there while you're doing 16 knots going down that line and you pull that boat back and you got a 60 pound water line still trying to go that way, he, he can, he can pull, you'll pull the hooks. That's a lot of pressure now because that 28 pounds of drag while you were running was one thing. You slow that boat down. That's a whole lot more weight on that fish and uh, you'll pull it. So we always like to try to, we mark it. We try to back that drag up. Tell them what happens when you got the drag too high, Clay? Huh? So, um, but yeah, so that's kind of what happens. And um, you know, the Wahoo fishing is a, it's probably the funnest sport there is of, of all this plague, except it's expensive. I mean, these lures aren't cheap. The fuel ain't cheap. The travel to get there ain't cheap. So when you're out there, you want everything to perform at its best for you. Um, I mean, that's pretty much what I got to, to say. I would tell you that in my beliefs, um, the very best way for a setup is two wire lines. Um, you could use stainless steel wire. I prefer Manel. Uh, stainless steel wire, if you're gonna use it, daily you need to bring it in. You need to rip off about 50, 75 yards of it, snip it and retie it. The stainless where it meets your rod tip um, it's, it, it's crazy what happens. You, you'll wind, you'll be in and out with a fish all day. You'll wind your lead up. It'll come right to the rod tip and it'll go, beep, drop right in the water on your leg. No kinks, no dings, no nothing. It just, so you want to take the stainless and retie it every day while you're out fishing. Monel, I really don't have that problem. Um, the braided line, well, it's, it's, a, I fish a whole season on a braided line as long as I don't foul it up. I do like to fish a white line when I'm fishing wahoos for, on my braided line for the simple fact is I can measure this out in the cockpit. I can get myself a Sharpie. I can mark where it is. It's, it's easy, it's quick. You put it out, you get to your mark, you lock it up, you're ready to go. Now, one thing I haven't said is when you're deploying baits, um, we used to try to do, do this at 15 knots, which is it's dangerous, it's crazy and not recommended. Again, I was not wanting to relinquish the edge, so I was kind of mean. I'll leave it at mean. Um, I call it a dance. It's kind of like king fishing us charter boat guys out here. You know, we got a couple of planers out. We got a couple of long riggers out. When you're coming, if I'm coming to the line and I'm headed in from offshore, I want my mate to put in my, my outside one coming to the side. That way, when I get to the shallow water and I make that turn, you can send out my other long out. Well, I don't have to change my operation of the boat. As I'm coming out the other way and I make my turn from offshore back inshore, I want him to put that outside one in again. And then when I come back inshore and back offshore, he can put the other one outside. That way you're not running this bait over this bait because a lot of your problems happen on deploying your leaders. If you trying to go in a straight line, you got your wake rolling up like this. You try to send that lure, you'll watch that lure of dance on you. And when it does that, it can just flip over your other lure. And when it does that, you got a mess and it's, it's hard to overcome that. You, it's stripping off two, 300 feet of line, cutting it and retying, takes a lot of time off. So it's important to make that dance. You get your guys used to it. My guys, you know, that, that work for me, we don't have to talk. They'll see which way I'm turning. They just know where to put their bait out. I turn the other way, they're putting the other bait out. And it's, once you do this enough, it's, it becomes almost automatic for you. And I do recommend doing that because, and take more than one guy with you. Cause like I said, uh, jigging Wahoos is, uh, it's a lot more productive than you think. A lot of guys, I watch them on the line all the time. They'll, they'll be rolling down the line. They'll get a fish on. They start turning offshore. They're working their fish. I come by there and I get a double or triple. I'll work offshore, get my fish, come back in, set back up. Don't be afraid to reel in, start jigging. Wine jig, wine jig. Even when that boat's coming out of gear and you're, you're down off of your plane and you're turning offshore, your guys that are reeling in to clear the other baits, 
have them reel and stop, reel and stop. I was in San Sal, which there's a picture there with the Wahoos in the red back of a red pickup truck. And uh, so the bite was really off where we were and we ran 60 miles over to San Salvador to fish that day. And it was, well, I jumped a 70 foot Viking boat, like a cigarette boat. I mean, completely airborne. Rogue Wave came up and we flew. They don't like flying like a cigarette boat, I can tell you that. Washing machine didn't make it. Um, two of my anglers were piled up on the floor next to me. But um, once we got, everybody else kind of had to slow down. We had a pretty quick boat. And uh, once we got over there, um, I set up, I'd already been over and set tracks with my, that had my track line on my plotter. So I already knew my line that I was having to drive. I didn't have to map it. We set them out, boom, we're in them right away. Um, I don't know if you guys ever seen or heard of the cowbells. Um, they make the cowbells. Um, I don't personally fish a cowbell usually. And it's not because it doesn't work because it works exceptionally well. The problem with the cowbell is, is I run a very nice transom boat, got a very nice teeth, and cowbells are very hard on uh, your transom and they're very hard on your teeth. Um, but they work. I went over there, we ran over, I got a double on, they're 70 pounders, and um, I'm slowing down. We're only fishing three line, even then, because that's kind of a rough day. And uh, I said, slowed down. I started to wind it in that cowbell. I got eight. It came off. I started winding again. I'm literally just a bump idle now. Boom. I got another one on. That one ended up weighing 80 pounds. And that was with a falling cowbell that was not even, we weren't even moving enough to keep that thing moving. It probably was 30, 40 feet down at that point. <laughs> so I would say that it's nice to have those on the, on the, on the boat. Um, they do work. Um, I kind of tried to modify them because they're kind of skinny lures and I kind of told you that I have a, a big thing about bodies in my lures so I tried to modify it. It didn't really work well because it's got a very smooth stainless steel sleeve and it's hard to keep line on it. Um, you know if you're going to make wahoo lures or reskirt your wahoo lures it's very important to make sure that skirt sticks because that pressure on a skirt going at high speed will peel them right off and they'll be bunched up at the back of your hook. On the heads that I make, I, I glue them, I wax line them, I glue them again, um, just to make sure, because I don't know how many times when I first developed this skirt, uh, or this head that I, I was having, even and I had them collar it to take two skirts, the pressure was making it slide off. Um, so now I make sure that that don't happen when it does happen. When you're fishing wahoos and you're using rubber skirts and you're fishing a head like this, or like this, or any of these, or even the compacts that are underneath, make sure that you take plenty of those with you because you can't buy them over there and Wahoos chew them up quickly. I mean, there's many days you'll be in there going, eh, it's, I mean, look, this one bite, you know, and he's, he's chewed that much of that lure out. Now you get a couple bites on that, that's gone. So it's very nice to have, you know, the colors that you like when, you know, when I order from Jordan, um, for the heads, for especially for my lures, I order, you know, 25 of these, 25 of these, 25 of these, 25 of these. I'm not saying you need to do 25 of each of them, but I'm saying you do want to have the placement skirts to fill them. You know, colors are very important. Flying fish are around. You want pinks and whites. You want blue and white. Um, tuna's around. You might want a little darker color, a little fatter lures. Um, the ghost, like you remember the ghost? So when, when the ghost, I was in the Grand Bahama tournament and we had made Islander make us an all red head with the opalescent skirts. And we wanted that for high Sundays. Like we like light color lures on bright days. We like dark color lures on dark days. So we came up with the ghost and I had this guy, we were coming back from Gorda Key and we had a couple of fish in the boat and I was eight pounds out of first place. And we're coming towards the end of the day. It's like 2.30 in the afternoon. It's sunny, sunny. There, there's not a ripple on the edge. And I'm up ahead on the edge and I got this boat and he's gunning me down. He's got, the, he's got those cowbells out and he's 20 knot me. I'm 15 knots. I'm like, damn, I can't hold him back. These heads, 
15, 8, 16 is all I want. These things might kill you after that. They get deadly in the water. Um, all these lures, they go straight in the water. This thing dances. Anyway, this boat's moving up on me, so I tell my mates, I go, look, when that guy gets next to me, I said, I'm going to pull him back. I'm going to turn offshore. And I said, I want you guys to wind him in, and then I'm going to run ahead of him and try to get to that, that fuel there down the road and try to make him turn to think we have fish on him. Kind of how I operate. Well, a little tricky sometimes. Sorry, man, so uh, anyway, guy gets up next to us, and just as I'm getting ready to pull him up, bam, 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 got a triple header on him. Like, whoosh, pull him in. We catch a 41 pounder and a couple little ones. I come back around, get set back up. I come back through the line, catch two big kingfish, and uh, oh, there are. This spot's not. We ran in. We ended up winning the tournament by like 3.8 pounds, but. Um, it just goes to show you that you got to expect a bite any time. But anyway, the lure that made it was an all that all white with the red head that we called the ghost from then on. That white head and that bright sun, it, you couldn't even hardly see it. But it's the action, I guess, that created these wahoo bites. We come to find out that as we were using this, that whenever we had a high sun in the middle of the day, now I got 10 of them. We're fishing four of these on the on the spread, and we're finding that nobody else is getting bites. We're getting bites. I'm not saying we're setting the world on fire, but we were getting bites on that white lure. So we started making them now. They've become quite popular over the years. We tried to keep it secret for as long as we could, but it is a it is a good lure to have in your spread, and all white. Um, I've always been a Tina Turner guy myself. I love that black and orange. It's always Ooh. been done me well. But I can honestly tell you, like um, this one here has been whitehead, and this color has been just off the chain for us. We have caught some really monster fish on this. Four over 100 on that lure. Huh? I like to use this, the. What do you call that hook, the 12 0 Jordan? Yeah, 7691. Between a bender or open eye? Open. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I mean, for marlin fishing, you know, we like the curved by hooks. The wahoo fishing, I kind of look at it as a gap. Like I said, most of the time they're snagged from outside in. So you kind of want the best possible chance. I'm a single hook guy, and we tried the double hooks over the years. Um, a, it's a little bit dangerous when you're dealing with a fish, and B, they tend to grab a lot more weed. Well, like I said, most of the time, wahoos are an attack predator from the side. When they eat, they're going to snag themselves or inhale it. Big fish inhale it. Thanks, Eddie. Appreciate that. Um, I do like the stainless steel hooks better than the, than, than the steel hook, just for the fact that they hold that point. They hold their sharpness. They don't rust in your box. Uh, very important. It's, well, you want a sharp hook when you're dealing with them. So, you, did I leave anything out? You think I? Any? Uh, I like 480. I do like 480. Huh? Oh yeah. I, you know, it's a, and I like to replace it. Like I said before, you know, especially when you got a bronze insert, I like to replace that cable. As if I come back in, I'll have rigs already made up. Generally, whatever I make, they'll be almost to the same length, and I'll have extras made up. That way, you know, you look at it and you start seeing rust showing up. Cut that one off, pull it, you know, you save the hook. Just that cable's nothing, you lose skirt, it's quick. Throw another one on, you're ready to go. I like I like a hundred pound braid. Like I said before, a hundred pound braid on white. And the only reason I like the white, you could use yellow. To me, yellow stands out too much. I don't know what the Wahoo see versus me, but I like the white, just because I can take that Sharpie, I can mark it. I know when I'm getting there. On the Monells, like I said, we put it 150 back. We'll put an empty, another reel that's got room in it. We'll measure it out, roll 150 on there. We'll take a 
wax line and we'll wax line a loop on there, kind of like just small enough to go through your, your guides, but just to have that mark going through. Um, this kind of makes it easier anytime you can mark it. That's all I got. Anybody have any questions? <coughs> That's it. How far back on each corner? On the corners, I like the, the same thing. I, I fish from 150 to 175 in the back. And, uh, you know, you can fish 250 to 350 back in the, off your shotgun. And uh, that combo kind of just works well. We kept trying to fish, you know, two, two <coughs> bent butts in the corner and then two straight butts over them on braid. But because of the narrow beam, you start making turns. Especially in the center council, because it'll loop on you really quick, especially if you get caught in the sea. We found that we were crossing them up too much and spinning them up, and uh, it just became too much of a hassle. And I can tell you, one of the best guys in, in Wahoo fishing in the day, Ronnie Chapman, um, he, even in all the tournaments when I'm fishing six lines, he still was only fishing three. Because those three lines, it can be very efficient and effective. Like we fish four lines on ours, two bent butts, two straight butts over top. We still might have an issue every now and then, but I have a, a big crew. My crew are very good. And, uh, uh, you know, like I said, we're just trying to make production at that point. A lot of times, uh, even with us, we only fished three lines several times last year, right? So it's, I'm not against it. What's your ideal water? Ah. Uh, it's a blue purple. I like the blue purple. I, I never, well, here's, it's funny. I don't really look at water temp so much. It's more of a wintertime fish. And it changes from area to area, but you know, uh, 76, 78 is, seems to be always been pretty good. But the most important thing is color. Color is by far the most important thing with waters. And you want to pay attention to where the bait is. Bait's, bait's critical. I mean, you know, I heard this old formula when I was a young man that was, it was F plus L plus P equals S, right? So it's, Fish plus location plus presentation equals success. Um, you can have the best tackle. You could be in the best place, but if there's no fish, they're not going to bite. You could have fish there, but you're not in the right place or the right tackle, they're not going to bite. You could have the best lures in the world in the best place, but you might not bite if they're not there. But if you have all three in that formula, you could have an epic day. So it's always important to pay attention to that. I will swap colors throughout the day. Um, if I'm not getting bites 45 minutes, an hour in, and I'm fishing darks in the morning, I might throw a light in or two lights. Um, once I find what's biting, I try to concentrate more on what I have out that they've been eating. Um, it's kind of like king fishing out front, right? You go out there some days, you got a blue and white sea ridge or a green sea witch, and you put a pink and white out, and boom, kings keep eating that pink and white. Pretty soon you got two pink and whites out. I mean, it's kind of the way to do it. You want to kind of focus on what's working. Um, make sure, I'm telling you, most people don't use these, the black holes that we used to call them, Island Express. I'm telling you, this is a, a pretty good short bait. We have had tremendous luck with them. It's, they work, you know, in the Islanders. I've always been a fan of them, um, but I, that Island Express got those jets in it. I guess it holds the water better. It doesn't pull real hard against you. It's a really comfortable lure to use. I would highly recommend if you don't have them to have a couple in there. Um, you know, jet heads, I would recommend jet head or two. And then your cone head lures uh, always work good. And you got like the sand sow candies. Now you got a flat concave head. This lure will give you a little bit more action than you'll get out of a bullet head. Uh, jet head will give you a jet stream. It's always worth it to have those as well. I mean, everything I have here is everything I believe in. I got, it's, you know, under here, there's a whole bunch more of them. They all kind of replicate just different colors. So it's, uh, you know, you'll find that once you find what you like to work, make sure you have enough, make sure you have replacement skirts. And how many times I've been over there going, man, have we got any more of this color? Mm -hmm. Nope. You wish you did. So I would, I would say that. John, how long has your sock hook, your ledge, your lure? 
That's a good question. Um, I like to fish them from 50 to 75 feet. Um, we used to try to fish them shorter and longer, but I find 50 to 75 feet as well. Um, and the, that's another good question um, that I never said to you is, don't make your leaders too long. I mean, you got a lure, especially a lure like this. Like when I rig this lure, this, this is only gonna be three feet long, this leader. And the reason for that is this head slides up, wahoo's eat, those lures, they'll go right to this crimp. I've seen them impaled into that crimp. And that fish is up there shaking his head and you got, you got a 40 ounce lure and it's sitting there going like this and he's hooked on the outside, he's shaking. He's just ripping a bigger hole. So the closer to your mouth it is, the less it can just get that velocity to rip that hook out. At least that's the way I see it. Um, it's not a proven fact, but that's kind of the way we see it. We don't want head, or you get that head too far up, it goes to the end of this and you got a school fish wise. Now you got another one comes up there and eats you off the crimp, he might cut you off. You know, that's another reason we don't want that lure traveling. In the day we used to put a bead and we'd take wax line, put a bead on ahead of the lure and we'd take a piece of wax line and we'd wax line that real tight on the leader to keep that lure from being able to slide far up because if it gets up to the shock cord, the other fish comes in there and he eats you, he'll just cut you off, now you're lost too. One time, so a story on Tommy and me. We wanted to be, like I said, we're always trying to innovate. So I, talking to Tommy, we had 32 ounce sleds back then. We were only fishing 32, 16. And I said, Tommy, I said, you know, I'm thinking because of all the lead bites I want, I want to put a hook in my cigar leg. <laughs> so Tommy goes, yeah, that might be a good idea. So, so we did, we, take, we took a long shank, uh, Levin O. We put it onto a split ring. We hooked it up there and I wax lined that baby right to the cigar lid. And we're trolling up there. We're not even quite to Isaac's. Bam, we got a bite. Biting a fish. I got two fish. I got one on the cigar lid and I got <laughs> one on the lure. It was the last time I ever did that in my life. It was the most dangerous moment I've ever seen in my life. We, we were able to get the first fish in, but the other fish is trying to pull. And we're trying to deal with that one. And now you got that hook. And that hook's it's trying to rip it back into us. When we finally got the second fish in, we decided that's not the way to go about it. Did work though, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I was really proud of myself. I came back, told Tommy, yep, caught a double header on one rig. <laughs> right? It was dangerous. Does anybody else have any questions or did I leave anything you thought out or? So you want to fish your heaviest weights closest. And you want to fish your lighter weights out. Um, what I found over the years is, which, which is, this is a good question, you said, I only in the last six, seven years started fishing 64s. I mean, you know, we're fishing 80s, we're fishing Monell on these. When I first started and for the longest time, especially when we were fishing the six bait setup, we would fish uh, 32s, uh, 16s, and 12s on the tag lines. And what we found was it's, again, it's not really the weight of the, of the lead, it's, it's what it does to the complete rig. Like with the shock cord to the lead, to the lure, all it does is create stability to keep that lure in the water. Like Monel, when you fish Monel off the corners, Monel, it bellies into the water, right? It's water column, it kind of has a belly. So now you've got a sag coming down, you know, it's sagging down, it's going to your lure and your pool is kind of more even to the surface. Braid is flat, it's, it floats on the surface. So it, it tends to want to stay higher in the water column. Um, but the one thing that we've seen was <clears throat> is we've fished all the different leads and we even could hold with a 12 fishing off the tag lines, 17, 18 knots, it wasn't skipping or jumping. That was just with an islander with hardly any weight to it. Um, so it, 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 it's not important where lead really matters is on, on sea condition. Like if, you know, if it's four to six and you're pounding up the line, or especially when you're running down sea, which Wahoo fishing is a lot tougher down sea, especially in center councils, because they'll pick up, get on plane, and you'll go from 
16 knots to 26 knots, just like that, you know? And so it's, that's where the weight's more important than, than any other time. Otherwise, um, just remember to fish your heavier weight short and your lighter weights out towards the back. I would, absolutely. Um, I, you know, because you need to figure out what's biting, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after the first day you're, you're fishing and you see that you've got a trend, because it's trend. Every, and I, I said about the purple and chartreuse uh, islanders, I would order a dozen when I go out there next year, they're eating blue and white. Same time of year, same conditions. They're just eating blue and white this year. Um, so it's, once you figure out what they're eating, then you can start focusing more on that color. Because, uh, you know, it's, it, it changes and it's always changing. It, it'll change from day to day. I mean, I've had it when we fished the six bait things. Um, you know, we had two mono tag lines. We had the two braided lines and we had the two monels. I, there's days they're only eating the monels up short. One day they're only eating the braids and some days they're only eating the tag lines. There's, there's no rhyme or reason. We haven't changed anything. Our setups are basically the same, but some days those fish just relate different to what the, what's happening in the spread. So it's, it's important to change that. I mean, you can change it up, you know. It's, the only thing you don't want to do, you know, you don't want to get the stagger too far off because once you start making turns and you cross sets over, that's when you're going to end up getting tangles. So especially on the short base, we always stay pretty focused at 150, 175 feet. We try to keep those two together because no matter how you turn, they're going to turn together. It's very difficult for them to tangle with each other. You have one out here, 250 and one at 150, and you make this turn, this one's going to come over top of it, and then you got a problem. And then, you know, you go back, you won't even realize that it's happening. But you'll, you'll go to wind that thing in and it'll be a tied up mess. Sorry. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of what I got. Oh, I, I'm really glad you asked that. So me and my mate this year, we were talking about it because... Uh, nomads, um, they they work very. I don't, lip baits they don't go fast enough for me. All right, but uh, um, I have a hard time keep like marauders. You know what a marauder is? All right, so the marauders is one of the most amazing lures to get a bite. I mean, you can put a marauder out. I mean, I've had blue marlins eat those things. Dude, I'll be trolling in the spread and I watch that thing go out, and then I watch that thing come right back into the spread. And what we I've seen marauders that are literally chewed all the way to the wire through them. Hmm. Um, that orange and black with the black on them, you might even have them here. Those lures get eaten. The only problem I've ever had, I can't make, I, the hookup ratio is just horrible with them. I mean, we've tried wax line, you know, they had them double hook. We tried taking them off. We tried getting a Sobe hook on there and wax line in it. Um, we just, we couldn't make them stay on the hook. I'm not, they work exceptionally well. I just had the hookup percentage. I mean, hookup percentage on these, when they eat, they're usually young. The Marauders, it's, it's, I mean, they're good to have. I mean, I'm telling you, they work for sure. But I, you know, my concentration when I'm out here fishing is more on speed. And, and, and when I'm not going fast and I, I really still am very old school. I like to have a, you know, a split tail mullet or wedge head mullet swimmer or a horse ballyhoo double hooked with a Hawaiian eye. Um, I know if they eat that, they're stuck. Um, but they work good. Lip lures work well too. It's, um, I'm not against them. The vibration's awesome, especially in a lip lure. Problem is you get too fast, they'll turn over on you and they'll want to start coming back to the surface. That's a downfall to the lip crankcase. But if you're just going to bump around, yeah, absolutely, they work good. Uh, so then, the lips, yeah, the lip plugs, the marauders, you know, you can go eight knots and ten knots. I have the high speed to get bites, you know, on those lures. And then the marauders, another thing the captain told me is push the drag up further, like 35 pounds of drag to drive a hook on, you know, instead of fishing like 26 or 28, push it up 35 pounds. And that's what varies the hooks with those marauders. I guess, uh, Oh. Anything else? Yes. I have a question. Captain, what do you consider a high speed for out front fishing? Out front here? Yeah. Uh, 10, 12 knots. Okay. And a bit of velocity? 
Um, I like I like between uh, my ideal speeds that I find is like 14.8 to 15.2. Um, I will fish if I have people motoring up on me. I'll push it up 17, 18 knots. I don't like to give up the line, but I find that my lures work the best between 14.8 and 15.2. Trey will be able to answer all the out front stuff better. He, he's out front specialist, right? That's right. Try. Anything else? All right, I'll turn it over to Trey. All right, guys. Um, any questions on planer fishing out front of here? Wahoo fishing, catching kingfish? No? All right. Um, what up? Um, anywhere from like 120 to 300, depends on what you're trying to catch. What do you want to catch? Wahoos, all right. Uh, look for some blue water, nice edge, good current. What do you got, Jim? 200, that's a good spot. 200, 180 to 300. But anything, fish a bigger bait for Wahoos, a little bit quicker, longer strip. Um, split tail mullets work pretty good this time of the year. Mullet run, bigger bait, a lot of bait out there right now. So you got a lot of ballyhoos offshore, so your drone spoons would work good this time of the year. Um, yeah. Do you have a color line? Do you have a color line at 300? Fishing on the inside of that? I'm going to get on the cleaner side. For sure. Yeah, get on the outside, get on that clean water. It's a little longer leader. I like to fish my short a little shorter, probably 100 foot, and then my long like 120 to 130. Doesn't matter, 15, 20 feet of 60 pound fluoro, and then I'll do 100 foot of just regular 60 pound mono. But, uh, four and a six, or a four, six, and an eight. But it's my go to. Darker color on the short, closer to the prop wash. When the fish is looking up, you want that white instead of like the blue, you're gonna have a darker bait in your prop wash. And then on your long, you'll have your pink or your ghost or something bright that they'll see. Any other questions? No? Um, I got a couple different rigs. I could demonstrate how they work show you what, how our bridle system works. If any of you guys got any questions about that? Any of you fish the bridles? Yeah? You got any questions about it? No? All right. Um, uh, which, where at the, at the connection? I do a loop knot, because after time, um, the swivel kind of gets chewed up and it'll actually cut the line right where it cinches down at your, at your swivel. So I'll do a loop knot or crimp it if you're not comfortable with a loop knot. Yeah. Yeah. I'll change my bridles probably every 10 trips. Depends on if I'm catching fish or if I'm not. Change out the swivels, get fresh swivels on there. Um, I'll put my short, probably quick 20 seconds, one, two, three, four, five, and then the long 40 to 45, kind of pretty quick though. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep, your bigger planer is going to be short, your smaller is going to be your long. Yeah, two high lines, a uh, long and a short, usually a sea witch or a little flathead chuggers, but something like that. A little compact squid with a flasher and a strip. Ballyhoo with a sea witch over top works pretty good. Yep. Yeah. Um, on my short, I like it a little heavier, and on my long, I like it a little lighter, so you can see the bite. It's better when you're 
you hook a nice fish, you got that give in the rod, so you're not, you don't have a stiff rod, and you don't have any play for the fish to run or give head shakes. You want that lighter rod, so it's gonna bend and be easy on the fish. Straight butts, no bent butts, planer fishing will not work out good for you. You won't be able to see your bite. But my favorite color, um, blue and white, pink and white, blue and black, blue, white, black, purple. That's a good one. Um, no, anything dark. I like dark colors. Work good. Got to match the hatch. Match what they're biting out here. Bullet bonitas, flying fish. You know, speedos, pretty much everything. You know. Um, on my depends what I'm fishing. My short, I'll do a little heavier, like twenty to twenty-four, and then on my on my long, I'll do like seventeen to twenty. Yeah, so you got a little more if you need it. If you got seaweed or some shit on there, sorry. <laughs> what's up no when i get a good bite i'll back off the drag keep the boat going a little quicker get another bite out of it and then once i get into a turn i'll slow down the boat a little bit and start fighting the fish single hooks pulled a lot of fish off with the double hooks had a lot more luck with the single hooks hook better but Probably another minute or so, and then drive offshore, try to get away from them and start fighting the fish, get into a turn. Yeah. Sixty pound. Won't go lighter. Scared. Never know what you're going to hook out here. But I like to use 60 to 60 and then connect it with a blood knot or a swivel. But I tend to do a blood knot. Not always going to have swivels with me. But when I'm fighting a fish, probably three to four mile an hour. Depends if I'm going into the current or with the current. If I'm going with it, I'll go a little faster. But definitely, if you turn into it, definitely slow down to three or four mile an hour so you don't pull them off. Nope. You guys got anything else? What's your favorite lure going off? Um... I've been making my own sea witches, some bigger profile stuff with a bullet head. Um, the Stan Ruer, he's been around forever. I've caught tons of fish on these, hundreds of fish on these. These are really good lures for out here, small profile. Catch anything from a bullet Benita to an 80 pound Wahoo. So, uh, Benita strips, mullet strips, whatever I can get. Un, under the skirts, under the sea witches. I fish a compact skirt with a little mylar flasher or like a no alibi feather underneath a compact skirt like that. Those work pretty good. They don't hold up as well as the mylar, but they, they work good. Are you fish wire? No, I fish mono out here, but if I'm getting a lot of cutoffs, I'll slip out a piece of wire and see if I can still get the bite. But I don't really usually fish wire, just straight 60 pound mono. Uh, 12 0, single hook, 12 0. Yeah. It's a limerick. Mustad used to make them. We're using a new stainless hook now from Seaworks. They work really good. But. <laughs>
That's all I got. Well, no more questions. Just want to say thank you for everyone coming out and showing support for us. Um, there's still plenty of drinks left. We'll be hanging out for a little bit longer. If you have any questions for Mark, Trey, or any other guys, feel free. Um, but just thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys. Woo!